that we use in theological cir circles to talk about uh, both angels and demons. And so that's important uh, for us to understand as we dive in. And we're talking about uh, supernatural activity when we talk about angels and demons. And in the public sphere, really the supernatural in the West, uh, in the United States, is uh, on a decline because of rationalism and materialism is really holding the day. And so when we think about uh, angels and demons, um, um, many of the people that you're around today, probably not as much in the South as it would be in other places, uh, disbelieve the, uh, the existence of angels and demons. So people can tend toward one or two extremes. One extreme would be everything is supernatural, and then the other extreme would be nothing is supernatural. And so the Bible doesn't really give either of those extremes. It really presents the view that we both live in a natural world uh, and a supernatural world here on earth. And so when we in our culture are dealing with people, a lot of times the bias today is toward a materialism and toward rationalism, and it clouds a viewpoint on these issues. As a matter of fact, obviously this reference won't be of today, but Thomas Jefferson, who uh, was a president, fourth president, I believe, uh, or as a third president. So, but he uh, helped uh, pen the Declaration of Independence. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about Thomas Jefferson at the beginning of our nation is he's a deist, and so he didn't he he liked the teachings of Christ and he followed them. And he's famous for having what is called the Jefferson Bible, where he cut out the parts of the New Testament, the Gospels in particular, that dealt with the supernatural activity. So you wouldn't find. Uh, Jesus uh, healing people, you wouldn't find Jesus uh, being resurrected, you wouldn't find a virgin birth, you wouldn't find those things in what is called the Jefferson Bible because of his rationalism and his approach was basically, he really likes the teachings of Christ, but he didn't like the supernatural aspects. And I think a lot of people in our culture today have, have fallen into that. Now let's think, think about, we talk about angels and demons, that human knowledge in itself is insufficient to determine uh, the existence of the supernatural. So it's tainted by our depravity. It's uh, limited by our uh, frailty. And so we keep that in mind. And so humanity on uh, its own doesn't have the ability to ma make a probably sound judgment on these things. And so that's why we need the revelation of God when it comes to things such as the creation of angels and demons. Now, you're probably familiar with angels and demons, even if you haven't read the Bible, based on the fact that you've probably seen a TV show or maybe a movie that uh, goes into uh, demons and goes into, uh, you know, there's a whole show called Lucifer, I think, that's on Netflix. You know, if you're old enough, you may even remember uh, like a TV show like Touched by an Angel. And so I don't. There, there's probably a few others. I can't say I was ever into the whole a genre of angel TV shows. <clears throat> it wasn't just my cup of tea. But then you'd have not only uh, the TV shows, but you'd also have movies. The one that uh, came to my mind in particular was Angels in the Outfield, you know, with the baseball one. Well, you know, where like the guy you know goes to catch the ball, and the angel picks him up, and he, you know, that that's what I remember for that movie because my boys watched it when we were we were young. And I don't know if you remember the show Charlie's Angels. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That didn't have anything to do with angels. That was a whole different type of angel. And so, <laughs> with that in mind, we're going to dive into this. And so, what I want to do is because this is introductory, is ask the question: Why why should we study this topic? Because many people say, well, the subject's really not worth looking into uh, because there are other important doctrines and theological practices and things that we need to spend our time on. And, and there's probably a little bit of truth to that, uh, but I believe it's important uh, for several reasons. And we could just really say, you know, anything that the scriptures have, we should be interested in studying. So the first thing is, when it comes to reasons why we need to study the topic is, it's the revelation of God on the spiritual dimension of life. Not just your personal spiritual life, but also the spiritual dimension of the whole universe. So if God wrote about it in his word, 
it, he found it uh, worth revealing to us, we should find it worth uh, discovering what he's revealed. And so I don't believe that there's any ir- irrelevant material in the scripture. Even like we've talked about before on Sunday mornings, genealogies that we, t- you know, tend to, anybody ever skipped over one? Like you're reading, it's like, ah, it's genealogy, I really don't. Even the genealogies have uh, points to make, and they're not irrelevant to our life. Now, we could say some of the points in the Bible are easy to apply, where some of the others are harder. So, like, if you go and you read the book of James, a lot of people like the book of James because the book of James is written in a very practical sense. It talks about the way that you talk, the way that you pray. And so we like that because it's really simple to understand. It's practical. But on the flip side, uh, there are other books that, you know, you're like, I'm not really sure what they're talking about. Like, uh, once you get past chapter 4 in Revelation, a lot of us are reading and go, I don't know what that's about. And so we read some of the text, and we don't really know how to apply it. We don't know what to do with it. But when it, and it comes with angels and demons, we sometimes feel that way. And so I think God has put it in here for us to learn, and it would do us well to, to explore the matter of God's creation and his providence over creation. So that's one of the reasons I chose for us to spend the next uh, several, probably couple of months, uh, talking about uh, the role of angels and demons in the world and even in our life. Number two, I think it helps guide us through contemporary issues. Uh, things that I get asked all the time and c- conversations, you know, for example, like you, you, people will say, do ghosts exist or is there such a thing as a ghost? And so we would get into this subject matter when we're talking about ghosts. Uh, do I have a guardian angel? And we'll talk about that as we move through here. Uh, another question was, you know, what about demon possession? Does that still happen? And, and if that can happen, who does it happen to? Does it happen to people who believe in Jesus Christ? Or can that not happen to a believer? And so we'll get in some discussion. And there's, you know, once you start thinking about all the questions, there's a lot of questions to begin to work through. As <clears throat> a matter of fact, when I first came to candidate at Grace Point, and we were uh, sitting in this room, and Trish and I were sitting down here on these stools, and people could ask us public questions about theology in our lives and things like that. One of the questions I was asked uh, that night was, uh, do you think you could exercise a demon out of a house? And, and so that was a question I got asked. And y'all want to know my answer to that question? I think I probably could. That's what I said. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. so I, I won't go into what, uh, every answer to that question, but I, you know, you know, I threw that out there. Anyway, but uh, number three, let's talk about this. It, it will help us navigate personal issues of temptation and spiritual warfare. One of the things that a lot of us don't understand is the nature of the enemy. And so we uh, obviously, uh, for Paul's writing, we know that we struggle with the flesh, which is us. And the world, so it's a system in the world. And then we also struggle with uh, own demonic activity that I will, as we work through this, called uh, being demonized. And we'll go more into why I use that phrase. But like when you go to Ephesians chapter 6, and Paul is talking about putting on the full armor of God. And he talked about our struggles not against flesh and blood. And when he says that, he's talking about people. Because who's flesh and blood? We are flesh and blood. And then he says, our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but it's with powers and principalities. And he goes into rulers. And, and so he goes into there's this, this sphere of enemy that we don't live as a reality a lot of times. But he said that's really where a lot of our battle is. And so then you could begin to talk about, well, if you're talking about angels and demons, you obviously eventually got to talk about Satan because, as we'll discover, he is a fallen angel and his name was Lucifer. And so then you, you know, you take a passage like Matthew chapter 4 where you, Jesus is encountering Satan and he goes into temptation, which parallels in a lot of ways the flesh, the world, and the enemy. And, and so when we read that, it, we can learn about how we are to deal with uh, temptation. Matter of fact, Peter and Jesus were one time having a conversation in the gospel, and then Jesus says to him, he says, uh, Peter, uh, Satan has uh, asked if he could sift you. And so, you know, that's a, an actual t- attack on a person, uh, what I would call being demonized and a satanic attack and so Jesus tells Peter this you know I always think in that passage like you know if I'm Peter 
you know, I think my first response would be like, well, what'd you tell him? You know, uh, did you give him permission? You know, or did you say, no, you can't do that? Because that would be important to me. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have these passages that obviously there's very real spiritual warfare. A, a fourth reason to look at this is it'll build a foundation for us to have accurate theology, anthropology, angelology, and those sorts of things. A lot of things that uh, that people talk about when it comes to God, to peop about people, and even angels and demons that are just not scriptural, and they, they're just off. It's just like when you, when I hear them, I go, ah, that, that, that's not really true, as the Bible's revealed these things. One of the things that, I won't say it drives me crazy, but I'm like, uh, you know, this is, this is not good uh, scripture when people say, and if you've said this, like I'm not trying to beat you up or make you feel guilty. I'm just going to throw this out there. So if you said it, look, there's forgiveness, but it's totally wrong. So when somebody has passed away, do you ever have anybody go, well, you know, they got their angel wings. You know, no, they didn't. They're not angels. Like you don't stop being a human when you die. You're still a human. And then, you know, your spirit goes to be uh, in an intermediate state to be with the Lord. If you're a believer, your body's still in the ground. But you, listen, you are still a human. You don't get wings. Like, when I get to heaven, I'm not going to have some wings. Fly. I'm not going to turn into like an X-Men or, you know, thing. So it's important that we understand that. So you don't get a halo either. Now, you, if you serve the Lord faithfully, you do get a crown, which that, you know, that's part of it. But when you hear people say that, I'm not saying like if you're talking to somebody and they lost a loved one and they say that to you that you correct them. I don't do that. Uh, not really. <laughs> you know, that's not really what happened. And so, um, so don't, don't do that. But do understand, you know, it's just not scriptural at all. And it's not true. And so that's important for us to understand uh, we don't get wings. Uh, we don't become angels. And, and, and you'll be glad about that, really. Uh, so let's talk about the existence angels. And, you know, and I'll just throw this out. You don't have to raise your hand or say anything, but do you believe that angels and demons exist? That's kind of the question we want to address tonight. Now, there's a 2020 uh, poll in the United States about seven, a little over 17,000 adults. And, and it's interesting because, and I have to write these down because I can't remember all these numbers. 50% uh, of people that were polled, so this is basically a good cross-section of the United States, 50% of the people believe that demons exist. Now, that means 50% don't. And so the question I would get you to think about is, if you don't believe that demons exist and you don't think they're real, then 50% of the people around you don't understand the enemy that they're facing. And that's important. Um, like 46% of the people uh, around us from this poll believe in ghosts. And so then you get a question like, so what are ghosts and what are demons and, and that sort of thing? And that's important for us to understand. So if you break this down, so the study broke it down into different categories of maybe religions or, you know, belief systems. So, like, in the Protestant group, which would be us, it's 67% uh, uh, believe in demons. So it's higher with us than it is with any other group. Catholics are 57%, and then atheists are 10%, which is really interesting if you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, but you do believe in other supernatural beings. Jews, 19%, which is really low. Mormons, 60%. Um, women believe slightly more than men. I think like women were like 54% overall and men like 52%. And so there was another study done in 2015 that, and you can see how this is changing really quickly in our culture, because I would even go back to uh, the 90s and early 2000. I think the belief in demons and angels were higher uh, in, in the polls that I looked at than they are today. Like in 2015, 77% of Americans believed in angels. So there's more people who tend to believe in angels, you know, the good, than they do the demons. And so that's important to understand because 
you know, the angels are good and they serve the Lord and they're holy, but like demons, they are trying to take people out. So it seems like today, just from the studies I looked at, that people are more likely to believe that angels exist than demons. Now, why this is important, I want to show you a text in Scripture. This is from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 11. And this is Paul writing, and this is, why it's, one of the, this is why it's important that we understand that there is a supernatural, immaterial realm that is around us all the time. And so Paul writes, and he says in verse 11, So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Now, what's Paul getting at? So Paul's saying there is a real enemy, a real being, Satan, and he has other beings that serve him, and they have schemes to destroy men. Why does, why does Satan want to destroy us? So, you know, Jesus said uh, the thief, he's referring to Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Why would he want to do that? I mean, because he hates God. He wanted to take the place of God, and we'll go more into Satan later, but he wanted to take the place of God, and, he, and God cast him out. And so when God did that, I think part of what's happening on a day-to-day basis is Satan wants to destroy, destroy God, but he can't destroy God. But when he looks at people, that's each one of us, who, do you, who does he see? He sees God. Not because you're God, but because you're made in the image of God. And because you're made in the image of God, he wants, to de- he wants to deface the image of God. He wants to erase the image of God. And so he's at work in that. So we know that we have an enemy. And then Paul says, you need to know that there's an enemy. It's just like watching, you know, two teams play. You want to know what the other team's doing so you can have a strategy to go against that team. So it's important that you know these things. And so Paul says, so don't be ignorant of these things. So learn about these things. As a matter of fact, it's not just the demons that you need to learn about, but I'll, I'll turn, you, uh, turn us to Hebrews chapter 13, which is a fascinating passage. Uh, <clears throat> you know, he says, he talks about let, let brotherly love continue, and then he talks about hospitality. And listen to what he says. He says, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Why? For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So he's saying to us, like sometimes when we come across strangers, we don't realize it, but we're, we're dealing with not a human, but we're dealing with an angel uh, is in disguise. And so you may be given the opportunity to show kindness to a stranger, and it's really not a person in terms of being human at all. It's actually an angel And so it's almost like there's a test. How do you treat people? And so, you know, that's one of the passages, like, don't you want to go, I got got some questions. And and so you have this this passage that the writer of Hebrews is saying, like, don't be unaware that you may be in the presence of an angel. And so we would call that an angelophany. So like when a theophany would be like God shows up in the form of human, like not Jesus because he wasn't in the form of human. He was actually in the flesh. We call that incarnation. But a theophany would be some Old Testament moments where uh, you, get, you, you come in contact with God and he's taken on the form of a human and you're unaware of it. But also it can be like with an angel, an angelophany, where you come in contact with this, this uh, supernatural being who has taken on the form of a person, or, you know, at least by your senses, it's a person. And so, like, the writer of Hebrews is like, be careful how you treat people. You, you don't know who you're with sometimes. So it's a, it's a pretty cool passage, and we'll look more at that in depth later. So with that in mind, how should we go about, say, proving the existence of angels and demons? Uh, the main reason we believe in angels and demons, obviously, because the scriptures reveal their presence and their activity in the world. And so we can find uh, these stories and these writings. And it's interesting when you read the biblical text that you, how many times you come across these different uh, references to angels and demons. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this as we roll through this, but obviously Jesus... Uh, 
uh, knew they existed and he even exercised demons and so that's an important point now and I want to kind of end with that point so we won't land on that and like science in general has a problem uh, when it comes to supernatural things because it's hard to measure those things and so the scientific community can obviously at times uh, be biased against supernatural because of the inability to have uh, empirical evidence of the existence or even that it doesn't exist. And so the nature of the study of angelology is a theistic study more so than a scientific study because when you're talking about supernatural things, immaterial things, that's quite different than uh, natural things and material things that will be easy for all of us to measure. And so when you come to the scripture, you can see different viewpoints of angels and demons uh, even early on in scripture but in particular in Jesus day there were two groups of people they're the Pharisees and the Sadducees and you've probably heard of those names I don't know if you know much about each of those groups but they formed uh, the leadership of pretty much the Jewish uh, at the temple during Jesus day and so the Sadducees were the 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 group that held to the first five books of the Bible. So um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so then you had the Pharisees who were another group, and they held the first five books of the Torah, but they also held the writings of the prophets. And so you had the law. So, so when Jesus would refer to the Old Testament, it was often the law and the prophets. And so you had the Pharisees who held to the law and prophets, and you had the Sadducees who said, no, the real word of God is just the Torah. And so the, you had those first five books. And so an in, interesting part of that is the Sadducees did not hold to a resurrection, and they also did not believe that the angels existed. Uh, Acts chapter 23, uh, Luke helps us to understand this. And so I want to read it to you real quick. So Luke is writing. You know, Luke was a doctor, and so he was well aware of material things and bodies. And so he writes this. He's also well aware of religious things, and so he writes this. So Paul was being uh, brought before the Jewish council. And the, uh, the Sanhedrin was made up of primarily Pharisees, and Sadducees. So verse 8, here's what uh, Luke writes. He says, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And so the Sadducees denied the existence of angels and demons, but the Pharisees says, no, there's angels and demons. And so I don't know if you realize this. If you believe in angels and demons, you're more like a Pharisee than you ever thought. You know, because you ever hear people at church go, well, they're like Pharisees. Well, if you believe in angels and demons and resurrections, you, you fit uh, with the Pharisees more than the Sadducees. Matter of fact, the Pharisees, they held to the Old Old Testament. And like, when you think about Pharisees, don't you think about people who are very legalistic and, and just people you don't want to be around, that they're probably really got a little bit of snootiness. But actually, the Pharisees in uh, those days were considered actually a little bit of the liberal group when, within Judaism, and the Sadducees were the hardcore fundamentalists because they were like the first five books of the Bible. And so you had this clash uh, even in early uh, Judaism between these groups. And so, you know, I think it's pretty funny that often we like to refer to people as Pharisees, but we don't realize how much we are like Pharisees, even in our belief system. And which is why probably in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus is talking about righteousness, he says, if your righteousness doesn't surpass that of the Pharisees, then, then you're not righteous. You know, because it wasn't like the Pharisees were bad people. I mean, they did bad things, but, uh, you know, they get a pretty hard rap because they or probably the leading group, and they are the ones behind having Jesus crucified. So when it comes to the angelic realm, all kinds of names in Scripture that we'll see, they are the sons of God, they are the holy ones, they're spirits, they're watchers, they're cherubim, they're seraphim, they're living creatures. And so you see a lot of references. As a matter of fact, the first reference that you have in Scripture, now there's some debate on which book was written, but in our chronological order we would put Genesis first and you know there's some debate with Job which one's first but interestingly both of them refer to angels 
uh, and they are the, you know, really primitive books of the Bible to speak of. And so Genesis 3, 24, where, you know, Genesis chapter 3 is where Adam and Eve sin and they, they fall and then they get, there's the curse on the serpent uh, which is identified, we know later, as Satan. And then there's the curse on the woman. And then there's the curse on the man. And then there's like the, the big time curse. And you, you uh, see this at the end of uh, chapter 3 when uh, God says in verse 24, He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim, which is an angelic being, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to uh, the tree of life. And so we were kicked out of the garden. And then guess what? You had an angel that sounds like he's got a big flaming sword that you're not getting back in. Right? And so you see very early on, this is the third chapter of the first book called The Beginnings, that you see uh, the introduction to angels. And so when it comes to angels, they're stated as being above humans. Um, Psalm chapter 8 is one of the great chapters that we talk about when we talk about anthropology, the study of humanity. When we say, you know, what is man? Who, what, is, what does it mean to be human? Psalm 8 gives us some answer to that. And then Psalm 8, uh, verse 4 and 5 says this, What is man that you're mindful of? So you got God. Why is God even thinking about man? Like if you, you know, just think about how small we are in terms of the universe. Like yesterday I was on a plane and I'm flying back to Douglas, and you're looking at everything. We were about 9,000 feet, and looking out the window, and you're like, you can't see anybody on the ground. Like, we're really small. And so David says, what is man that you're mindful of, the son of man that you care for him? And he says this, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, which would be angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. And so we, what we know is angels are more superior to us, uh, in their being because they're supernatural beings. You and I are not supernatural beings. We do have a spirit, so we have uh, an eternal aspect to us. But the angels are supernatural beings and not just natural beings. And so in that respect, they are superior to us. Now, there is a way that you and I are more superior to the angels, and it's simply this. We are superior in the fact that we are made in the image of God Angels are not. Man, that's a huge thing is that you are like a valued uh, person because you're made in the image of God. So the animals who are lower than us, they are not made in the image of God. The angels who are, uh, are uh, supernatural beings, they too are not made in the image of God, but we are. And so when we talk about angels, what do we mean? And so let me give you a little bit of a definition of what we're going to be talking about. We mean those beings which God created before the heavens and the earth, and they are superior to humanity in essence to being supernatural. And so angels are supernatural uh, creatures that, are, that serve and are obedient to God. Demons are fallen angels who are supernatural creatures who have been disobedient to God and in their condition they seek to oppose and to hinder the work of God and the activity of God here on earth, including the one angel we would call an archangel. We'll talk about the differences. Uh, Lu Lucifer, who uh, we call Satan or the devil, the one that you typically think of with the long tail and the pitchfork is red, in which he doesn't look like that, by the way. Uh, so we, that's, th that's who you're talking about. And so we should view angels as immaterial, supernatural, spiritual beings with the ability to appear in human form, which we talked about angel -ophanies. And so that's what angels really are. So the difficulty of studying angels and demons is uh, when you do study the Bible, and if you take time to read through these different verses, <clears throat> all the references to angels are incidental and they are not uh what's the best way to say it there's no attempt to explain everything about angels the christmas story the angel gabriel shows up to mary right who's the main character it's mary it's not the angel gabriel you don't get you don't get any information except his name he's gabriel and so you don't get to understand everything because, like, you go, I had a question about the angel. But the point of the writing is not 
of the angel, he's just what? He's just the messenger. And so he's not really the point. The point is really the message given to Mary that she's going to, to bear the Son of God. And so when we read the Scripture, it's not exhaustive in saying it's just setting out that for us to understand all of, of what it means to ha- be an angel. And so uh, God's informing us ultimately about himself and then about us. So that's why when we come to the Scripture, it's the revelation of God. And the reason angels are included and demons are included is because God's revealing to us about his work in the world, and so that's important. So, do angels exist? Angels did not exist at one time. That's important. Angels uh, didn't exist, and why do I say this? Because they were created. Like we were created, they were created. So they don't exist on their own. They're not self-sufficient. That they have to be created by God, by God, and sustained by God. And since they were created, there was a time that uh, they weren't before they were. Just like there was a time that you weren't, and now you are. There was a time angels did not exist. Now, so when did the creation of angels take place? The answer is. The scriptures don't reveal that exactly. As a matter of fact, the scripture is pretty silent on that uh, idea of when, the time. And so what can we what what can we learn from this? So if you go by all the way back to Genesis chapter one and two, which is the creation account. So you have creation account number one, which talks about the formation of the world, and then you have Genesis two, which is the function of the world. So you get into what relationships in the creation account. Angels are never mentioned. Like, if you go read through one and two, you don't hear anything about angels. You don't see anything about them. And so that's important for us to understand. But what we do know is that they were created before the heavens and earth as we read through the Scripture. And so they were created. So I want to take you to Job chapter 38 and show you a text that helps us to understand not exactly when, but we can get some idea that they existed before the world, as we know it, was created. So Job 38 is, if you don't know the story of Job, Job was a guy who was righteous. And Satan, one of the fallen angels, the main one, uh, is in a conversation with God. And God says, hey, have you seen my, my, my boy Job? And I'm, you know, adding some there. He didn't say my boy. Uh, and so he says, Job is righteous. And, and so the fallen angels, the devil says to him, well, he's, he's only righteous because you protect him. You, you, you give him goodies. You, you build a hedge around him. And so, like, everything in his life goes right. And so God says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll let you uh, do what you want to him, but you can't touch him. And so if you're familiar with the story of Job, what happens? He loses his business. All of his kids die. And so it's just him and his wife. I think he had 10 kids, if I remember correctly. And so everybody gets wiped out. So he loses his whole business. He loses all the kids. And, you know, he doesn't curse God. He still believes. And then God says to Satan, you see, I told you. And so then he says, yeah, humans will do that. But if you touch him, he'll curse your name. And so God lets out the leash a little further. The enemy attacks him. He gets diseased. And he's in bad shape. He's in such bad shape, even his wife tells him, you just need to curse God and die. Thanks for support, honey. And so, and so he's going through a miserable time. I mean, he's, he's in sackcloth and ashes. He's cutting his sores. He's in a bad place. Then he's got these three guys that come over, and, and they meet with him, and they're like, you sure there's not some sin in your life? <laughs> and and they, they give him some good advice. They give him some bad advice. And they have this conversation going back. And then by the time you get to chapter 38, Job has gotten to a place where he's about had it. And so he has the audacity to say to God, God, let me question you about some things, which is what you don't do. And so he begins to bring his case before God. So it's like going to court. And God, you're the problem. So God, in chapter 38, responds to Job. He speaks to him out of a whirlwind. 
and he starts asking these questions to Job. So in other words, Job said, I got some questions for you. And God says, let me rebut you. I got some questions for you. And then he starts in and goes, well, it starts, he says, who's this that darkens my counsel? You really think you know more than I do? And so then this is where we want to land. You'll see the angels in this part. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So that goes to creation. And so God starts off right at the bat. We'll go, I'm going to put you in your place. Where were you when I laid the foundation of earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined his measurements? Surely you know. I mean, you're asking me, God, questions, so obviously you know a lot. Or who stretched out the line? Like who, was the, who was the person that was a carpenter for this? On what base, where, where his base is sunk? And who laid his cornerstone? And, then, and here's where we see the angels. And when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, remember I said earlier, one of the references to angels is they are known as the sons of God, shouted for joy. So what do we see in that passage? We see that the angels already existed as the world was being created that you and I live in. And so we know that they, they were here at that point. So we know, uh, we can surmise that they were before all that. And so we see this in Job's writing, which is one of the very first books. And so what this means is fascinating because they appear... Before the word is written. So they existed before any of this because they were with God. And, and that's important because their job was to worship God, which is one of their jobs. You see them doing this. Isaiah 6, you see the cherubim, they're flying before God, the seraphim, and they are, they're worshiping God. And so part of what angels do is they worship God. Now, the second part of that is, so angels were created. Angels were created so we understand they, don't etern- they did not eternally exist. And that's important because God is the only being that has existed eternally. And this is to say he has no beginning or end, but angels do have a beginning. They don't have our beginning, but they have a beginning. And so we understand that angels don't exist on their own, so they're not self-sufficient. Who is? It's only God. And sometimes when, it, you know, if you had a, opportunity to see an angel and you live today you probably would walk away going that may be a god a god not the god and so i think that probably happens on occasion for people uh but to understand that they're created beings means that they are not god and that's important there is only god they're not little g gods there's just god capital g that's all there is He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Angels are not that way. So so why that's important is we take a look at Lucifer, for example. You know, somebody will say, well, you know, Satan's really been attacking me. They cannot mean that Satan himself is attacking them all the time because he's not what? He's not God. So he's not omnipresent. Uh, He can only be in one place at one time. And so he's limited by who he is. Now, We'll talk about he's spirit being, he's immaterial, so it's different from us. But that's who he is, and he too was created. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. This is one of the reasons that we hold that angels, just like us, were created, not at the same time, but that seems to be at a different time. But in verse 1, 16, it says, For by him, so it's talking about God, uh, all things... In, in particular, Jesus, are, were created in heaven and on earth. So, in the heavens, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So, what we discover, God created everything that exists. So, everything that does exist, exists because God created, and nothing exists that God didn't create. In other words, you and I, when we make something, we don't really create something like, we, we never have a moment where there's nothing and then we make something. We take what God has created and then we make something. But everything that you and I see, everything that is that we can't see, God created. It's the work of God. And so when we think about angels and demons, it's important for us to understand. What has God created? God has created all things. Psalm 148 
So if you come on Wednesdays, we, we jump around to a lot of passages when we're doing theology because it takes a lot of passages to understand these things and to grow in our knowledge of it. So Psalm 148, this is uh, verses 2 through 5. Uh, it speaks of the angels. So listen to this. It says, verse 2, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all shine, all you shining stars. So creations to praise him. Praise him, you highest of heavens and you waters above the heaven. Let the praise, uh, let them praise the name of the Lord. And listen to this last part. Why? For he commanded and they were created. When you go outside tonight and you see the stars in the sky and you see the moon and you, you take a look at creation, all of that is created to glorify God and to worship him. But also the angels, what what he say for you angels praise him. So God created them. And the psalmist is writing and says that they are created to praise God. And so there's this command, but they, it's because they're created and they are to, to acknowledge the creator. Now, one of the interesting things about the creation of angels is that they all seem to be, from, from my study, created probably at one time. And the reason for that is, uh, that, that, I, that I hold that, is because when you get to listening to Jesus in his conversation with the Sadducees, this is Matthew 22, 30, the Sadducees had were working with the Pharisees and the Herodians and different groups. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to trap Jesus because they wanted a reason to take Jesus out because he was a threat to everything they were doing. And so they, you may be familiar with this, this, this question they asked Jesus. So they came to Jesus and said, what happens if there's this lady and she marries this guy and he dies? And he goes to heaven, and then by Levitical law, the brother was supposed to marry her and, and uh, have children with him. And then says, and that guy dies. And this happens like seven times. And so their question is, you know, in the resurrection, which, by the way, they don't believe in, which one's going to be, uh, you know, her husband? And so Jesus, I want you, I want you to hear his answer, and this will get in the angels. But Jesus answered them and said, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So when we teach, when you get to heaven, you're not going to be married, you're not going to get married, so you're not going to be dating in heaven. You know, I know you may be disappointed by that, I don't know. Uh, and so when you get to heaven... That's how we're going to be. And he says, you're going to be like angels. So what does that tell you? It means that angels aren't getting married. And what is one of the reasons God created sex for marriage. So what, what the scriptures teach is the only place for sex is inside of marriage. That's the place. And one of the primary reasons for sex is what? It's procreation. So if the angels are not getting married, which means that they're not having sex, means what? They're not procreating. So it seems that they most likely were all created at one time. And we'll talk about their numbers and all that future time. But it's important for us to understand. It's like, so, you know, God created them, most likely all at one time, and that, that's how they exist. Now, what is the scriptural support for this? Is, are these passages like this? And the scripture uh, is both Old Testament and New Testament speaks of the existence of angels and demons over 200 times. And I don't know if you know much about references in the Bible, but that's a lot of times. Like, I think it's somewhere around... 265 times, but I, I didn't count every one. I just know it's somewhere upward of 200 times. And so when you take all the 66 books of the Bible, what you would discover is 34 of them mention in reference angels and demons. So that's a, a little over half of the books in the Bible 
reference angels and demons. Because it, like every book in the Bible is not designed to reference him. But what we, what we say is like, because you may say, well, well, really, Pastor, it's only the first few bi- books of the Bible that mention angels and demons. Actually, no. It's the first one all the way to the last one. Like Revelation talks a lot about angels and, uh, it, and Satan. And then in Genesis, you get introduced to them in chapter 3. And so in between... Uh, you know, you have 32 other books of the Bible that reference the angels and demons. And so that's significant. And so it's not limited to one type of writing or just one book. And so we're not like, you know, there's just one vague reference to angels. No, there are a lot of references to angels, 200 plus, 34 books. That's a big deal. Now, let me get to why I believe there are angels and demons like, this is the crux of the matter for me. And it's this. In the Gospels, in Jesus' teaching and his activity in the world, he talks about the angelic realm and he de- deals with the angelic realm. Now, Jesus teaches, like in that passage in Matthew 22, that angels exist. And why that's important is whatever Jesus says, it's what I go with. I don't know about you, but Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And whatever he says is what I believe. And that's what we as followers of Christ are saying. Like, it doesn't matter what the science world says or any other person says. At the end of the day, and this is for me, and I would encourage you to think about this, that whatever Jesus says is what I believe. Whatever Jesus did, that's what I believe. And so it doesn't matter what a scientist may say in the year 2022. That's a weird saying, isn't it? It doesn't matter if he says, well, angels don't exist. There's no evidence, you know. I would say, I really don't care what you say. I care what Jesus said. Because the difference between you and Jesus is this. He rose from the dead. You're not going to unless he brings you back that's the bottom line like what he did trumps everything else and and if Jesus is wrong on this what else is he wrong on and so I'm all in on Jesus and so throughout the gospels you see Jesus talk about demons exercise demons we see this and so to doubt Jesus is to question his truthfulness And I would even go so far to say this. When Jesus references other books in the Bible, the Old Testament, every time he references them, he references them as literal things, not allegorical. And that's significant. Because Jesus is the Son of God. And he's not wrong. And so when I see the world debating it, I go with Jesus. Because he is the one I build my life on. Now let me give you some other reasons why I would hold this experiential evidence. And my experience in this area is, I would say it's not too great. It's probably like yours. You know, that you probably have had some things you think, hmm, that was really weird. Uh, I don't know if you've had that moment where you're like, I, th- I think that was an angel I just entertained. I don't mean you took them to the movies, like you did something good. And so, you know, it, it's important that, you know, you're aware of that. And like, you know, and sometimes we're just, you know, like you said, you're unaware of what's going on. Um, the problem with experience is it's hard to verify. Like if you tell me a story about your life, it's all going to be based on what? Whether I think you're truthful or not. And you're like, hmm. Like he's on the sauce or something, you know. Uh, so it all has to do with the credibility of the source. Like, if you ever wonder why, and we'll talk more about this, like Jesus was like, whenever the demons would call his name, like Jesus was like, shut up. You know why he said that? Because they're not credible witnesses. I don't really need you speaking on my behalf. It's also why women, I right, won't get into that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so um, so when we think about, like, our experience, hadn't you had some weird experience and you're like, 
there's something else going on here that's not just natural. When I look back over my life, I, I think there have been some things. I, I will even say this. My mom told me a story. This is probably maybe even before I was born, and my mom and dad had just, uh, you know, had my brother. Uh, but she had always told me a story. She's never changed a story. But she says, one night, my dad was gone. It was just her and my brother. And he was, you know, obviously a small child. And this person came to the door, like, late in the evening. And came, and she let the person in. I can't remember if she said it was a man or a woman. But she helped this person and showed hospitality. And she never saw the person again. The person left. Uh, my dad never saw the person. And she will tell you to this day, she believes that that might have been a Hebrews 13.2 moment. And maybe you've had that too. Because that's the hard part of the site. A lot of times, it's uh, uh, you can't verify it. Now, I will say when it comes to demonic activity, I think I've been around that where I knew it a little bit more than angelic activity. And there was a moment where I used to work at a camp called Super Wow. Some of y'all heard that. This is back in the early 90s, and we were teaching and doing some things, and a, a guy was speaking who's a very godly man, and this one lady stands up, and she begins to curse, and I don't mean like she had Tourette's kind of thing cursing. I mean like she was vile, and so she was carried out of the arena, and she was speaking in another voice, and and just uh, it was one of those moments where, you know, we began to pray and speak scripture, and and she calmed down and everything changed, you know. It wasn't like the movie, The Exorcist, her head turned around. But it was one of those moments like, you know, something more is happening than meets the eye here. And so we, I had that experience. And then I had another experience when I went to uh, Ghana uh, years ago. Lee Mobley and I went for a vision trip to Ghana. We, there was a lot of occult practices in the uh, area that we're in. In, in Quanta was the area. And I was talking with a missionary there, and this really gets to the heart of, like, how materialistic I can be, and maybe you would be this way, too. So we're, we're there, and we, there's a guy who works for the missionary whose name is Mr. Ata. And Mr. Ata used to be what they call a fetish priest. So that he basically was an occult priest. And there were stories around the uh, tribe that we were at where he had used to do these really sensational things. Like one of the things that they talked about was that he, they, they, they would have wicker baskets, and he could carry water in a wicker basket. Anybody ever done that in the room? Like you get a wicker basket, and you put water in it, and it stays in it? That didn't happen. Like that's unnatural. And so there were stories of him doing things like that. And then... His wife eventually came to Christ, the missionary's letter to Christ, and she, he got mad at her not to go to church and got violent with her, and she hit him in the head with a rock, I like really hard, and put him in the hospital, and she felt guilty about it. She went to him. She asked him to forgive her as a Christian, and he ended up coming to Christ. It's a cool, cool story. I'm just telling you bits and pieces of it, but to get to this point. So I'm talking to the missionary. And we had gone out to meet this family, and this family was in, like, a straight-up mud hut. And they, like, Lee and I were the first white people they ever saw. They didn't speak English. We sit down and talk with them. And so they have a tree where they've been sacrificing chickens. And so, so we're having this walk back, and I'm talking to the missionary. And I said to him, is it strange to you that they, they worship idols because one of the things Mr. Ata had to do is that he had a little idol and that's who he served and I said you know because the idol was made of wood and if you've read uh, you know in Isaiah it talks about and and kind of really makes fun of idol worship like the way that we would think about it like if if, if you saw somebody today most of you I think and they were worshiping uh, a little bitty wooden, you know, about the size of a Lego man. <laughs> you would go, what would you say? You would say, well, that's crazy. Well, why would you think that's talking to you? That's wood or stone or metal. And you would say, and that's kind of how I was looking at it. I was like, 
these, these people are primitive, man. I'm like, these people are crazy. Like, doesn't even know that that's just a piece of wood? And then it, Lloyd reminded me of something. He's like, you know, it's not really the wood that has the power. It's what's behind it. And then he reminded me of this passage. I just wasn't even thinking about it. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, uh, he's, he's writing to them, um, and he addresses this issue. And make sure I get to the right place. Unless I wrote down the wrong thing. Oh, I wrote down the wrong passage. So this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he says, he's talking about people eating meat sacrificed to idols. You know, there was a big debate in the church. Like, should you do that or not do that? And so he says this in um, verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. So idols are nothing. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. And that's what he reminded me of the moment. It's like, there's a real supernatural world. Do not be deceived into think it's just material world. And I remember walking away from that moment and go, you know what? Maybe I'm way too unaware of this. Maybe you are too. Maybe I need to learn and grow in this so I can understand what God is up to in the world and even in my life. And so I want to encourage you, like, let's dive into this. We're, we'll, we'll try to cover as much ground as we can over the, it's probably going to take a couple months because there's a lot of ground to cover, but we'll try to get into angels, archangels, Satan, Lucifer, same person, um, demons, what it means to uh, demonize. We'll take a look at the different usages like in Mark's gospel uh, of telling us about demons and how Jesus deals with them. So that's where we're going.